Amen. Today's uh, the wrap-up of this three-week series we've been doing called We. If you remember back, it seems like forever ago now, but two weeks ago I preached, and we talked about us and them, uh, trying to kind of draw the distinction that many of us have lived through, some of us are coming out of, but still some still live in this sense of us and them world, where we kind of create differences that for some uh, divide us, for some it was decisions we made that we weren't even conscious that we made that perhaps were planted, I know in my case, as a child living in an environment that made it very clear who are the, uh, who are in, who's in and who's out. Last week, Clay challenged us as we talked about what the world would look like to be a you and me world. In a very powerful way, Clay challenged us to see that God has a desire and a plan to use everyone, even folks who we think or might have thought at one time, well, surely God won't use them. Well, today we're going to talk about we. We're going to try to wrap it up who is we? Who is us? What does that mean to live in a us sort of world? You know, it's been kind of interesting. And probably since I've been here at Treach, this series has elicited the most different kind of responses. All the way from, um, oh, you guys are dangerously close to this liberal agenda. To, um, y'all have gone now to troublemaking. To, it's about time I heard that in my congregation, a message of love and hope and redemption. Um, one of the lessons I hope that we can all take away from this is um, dialogue is one of the most important things in learning to understand and appreciate each other. And there are going to be times when things are said amongst friends and even from the pulpit you don't agree with. And the best way to react to that is in a conversation, in a relationship where you can say, I value you, I want, I want to hear more, I want to, I want to know more before I decide to make some real big decisions and just head for the hills. To that end, this morning, we're going to explore, I think in just, uh, I don't think, I know. Um, I want to have a conversation with you guys about what is it that will help us move more into this we world. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago, I used the analogy of having grown up in a bubble having spent most of my life maintaining and building and, and keeping that bubble intact. And now it's starting to kind of uh, get dismantled. And out of that, um, I continue to have these little moments of hope and moments of insight. And I'd like to invite you to also think throughout all of this about your bubble world and how perhaps this series has poked it. Maybe there is some air coming out. Maybe you feel threatened and you need to gather reinforcements. But uh, I can assure you it's all going to be okay. This morning we are using the metaphor of the body as one of the tools for all of us to understand how we are knitted together. If you think about the human body, all 206 bones, all of our different organs, the bloodstream, the nervous system, um, our insides are more alike than our outsides. Yet we judge each other by those things that make us different. When in reality, when God first started, God made us with more in common than we realize. This morning, um, well, throughout the week, we challenged Zach, our media guy, to come up, come up with a video that help, would help kind of pull us into that. I think he's done a really creative job. Let's check out this video, and then uh, we go, we'll go a little bit deeper.
the human body. Isn't that amazing? God designed, God intended. From form to function, from blood to bones. An amazing analogy of what we as the body of Christ also share. Paul spoke to this when he wrote a letter to the church in Corinth, which was made up of a whole lot of different folks, kind of like the church is today, not necessarily all getting along. Corinth was an interesting town because it was um, just like any other big metropolitan town. Folks from different incomes, folks from different educations, folks from different religious backgrounds. Uh, And as we, as folk have a tendency to do, not everybody saw it the same way. So Paul, in the amazing way Paul has, uh, wrote a letter to them talking about the body of Christ, their bodies, and if you would fast forward, our bodies, how God intended them to be used in form and function. Um, I think we're going to read it together. Do we? Let's do that. But God has put all parts of our body together in the way he decided is best. A body isn't really a body unless there is more than one part. It takes many parts to make a single body. That's why the eyes cannot say they don't need the hands. That's also why the head cannot say it doesn't need the feet. In fact, we cannot get along without the parts of the body that seem to be the weakest. We take special care to dress up some parts of our body. We are modest about our personal parts, but we don't have to be modest about other parts. God put our bodies together in such a way that even the parts that seem the least important are valuable. He did this to make all parts of the body work together smoothly with each part caring about the others. If one part of our body hurts, we hurt all over. If one part of our body is honored, the whole body will be happy. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for your word. Help us this morning to open our hearts and our minds to hear it and have the courage to apply it to our daily lives. From blood to bones to here you are today. What does this have to do with how we live day in and day out? How we express our faith, how we get to know our neighbor, how we uh, live into this we series. I think Paul's intent and our intent this morning is to identify that we are all made on purpose with a purpose, on purpose, with a person, with a purpose. Now, how in the world did we, do we discover that? Isn't that kind of the age-old question a lot of us continue, who are continuing to grow up ask, well, what is my, what's my, what's my purpose? Well, I think we have a very fundamental purpose, those of us who call ourselves Christians. And it's to learn what it means to love. And that is the primary cornerstone that we do everything else out of. All right, Doug, this love, this love thing. I've had a lot of interesting conversations this week with people who say, well, but love doesn't suspend or do, love doesn't say I can't decide that that's is wrong or that's wrong or this is right. You're right. But I think we do it in and through the lens of love rather than the lens of judgment and difference. If you hear, um, hear with me, 1 John 4, who says, If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he's a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. So what in the world does that love look like? As I was trying to figure out the most kind of fundamental way to get our heads around that. I went back to a story that we all heard a million times. Well, those of us who, um, who grew up in the church. It's a real um, basic story, The Good Samaritan. How many of us are familiar with the story, The Good Samaritan? We could probably fill in the blanks about how it ends, but I'm going to uh, read a little bit of it for you this morning. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. To me, that is love. Do we have opportunities to do that in our world today? We live in a world that for, for some is a scary place. We see uh, in our daily lives, right, I-35, a hallway at school, carpool line, you name it, there are settings where we come upon people who have been uh, robbed and beat up, sometimes literally, sometimes emotionally, sometimes uh, in ways that we can't even imagine. And what do, we, what do we do for the most part? We go through this big, long internal system of trying to decide what is the next best right thing to do. I know I do it. I know you do it. And uh, I wonder, though, if we can't step into that a little more aggressively. And name right up front some of our fears about why we... Um, you know, we tell our young kids, and, and I will continue to tell my sons and daughters, um, when you see someone hurt, uh, call 911 and keep going. But I, I wonder, as adults, if we, uh, what it would take for us to reframe that moment and uh, instead of passing on by, enter into that story. I know even as I'm saying this, that's risky. That is scary stuff. And all of the, like, these different sexist tapes are going on in my head. Well, you know what? It'd be okay if a big burly guy did that, because things don't happen to big burly guys, right? Right? That's why I'm working on the big part. Um, we come up with these excuses to kind of protect some folks and, and put other folks into it. And we see, like, those who have stepped up, um, gosh, it's a really horrible, hard world right now, I think, if you love, uh, if one of your family members is a cop. Folks who stepped into the line of fire and are just taking all sorts of uh, stuff for that. Uh, and we sometimes say, well, those, those should be the people who stop. Those are our collective representatives for care and compassion. And um, in some cases, yeah, I, I think so. But in a lot of other cases, folks, I think we are called to live into this love theme in a different way. Um, you know, we, we kind of joke and we laugh and talk a lot about getting to know our neighbor. Uh, I just wonder what it would look like if you actively pursued an opportunity to care for your neighbor. What would that look like? Uh, is there anybody on your street uh, who's... Um, I know we've always, we've, I, I give you guys a hard time about mowing the yard, but um, somebody whose uh, outward life portrays a mess. Instead of driving by and deciding, uh, gosh, you know, I, I wonder what their story is. I wonder, I wonder when the HOA is going to send them a note. Um, and, and I'm kind of poking at myself right now. Y'all don't know this little story, but around the corner from our house uh, is the, the neighborhood house. Does anybody else have a house in their neighborhood that's the house? Or maybe it's your house, I don't know. But uh, Wendy and I drove by yesterday and felt very convicted because we uh, were like, well, you know, somebody needs to take care of that. Their, their hedges are overgrown and their grass is overgrown. And I just see this teenage son coming and going from that house all the time. And surely they have a mower. I know what I'll do. I'll bring my mower over and I'll leave it on their porch. <laughs> I didn't really go that far, but I kind of thought it. Um, I felt very convicted last night as I was finishing up the sermon, and I was thinking of that story, and I thought, well, you hypocrite. You can't uh, call out people to be engaged in loving, acting deeds unless you're willing to do that. So um, hold me accountable. Today I'm going to go around the corner and just knock on the door and just say, hey, you don't know me, and I'm, I'm just here to maybe mow your yard. or Because uh, my sense is that on the outside, when things are overgrown and messy and full of weeds, that there's stuff going on on the inside that portrays that, hey, you know what, we're just treading water in here, Meyer. <laughs> hey, neighbor, whoever you are, you don't even know, know our story. How dare you, you judge us? Uh, 
Is that what it means to be the Good Samaritan? Is that what it means to kind of pull over and stop and say, although this situation looks really scary, I bet that mom with three little kids could sure use somebody to help her with the car right now. Or that kid in the hallway at school that um, has the look, and I know you guys all know the look, that, that look that says, I'm lost, I'm scared, I don't have any friends. I wonder if just today somebody might recognize me. Um, Grown-ups have that look. Grown-ups have that look in the grocery store or in the carpool line or uh, at the place where we go to get our nails done. And, and we get close to each other, but we don't get so close that we maybe get messy. We know from that story that the Good Samaritan got really close to that story, didn't he? He got off however he was traveling, the donkey, I guess, and he went to that guy, and he, he bandaged him up. Well, to bandage somebody up, oh, my goodness, how much closer can you be? And I bet he got dirty. I bet he maybe even got some blood on his hands. But what he did at the end of the day is he also entered into a relationship with that person. So it became almost impossible to decide, well, this is a bad guy, or this is somebody I can't spend time with, because now I know him. As we have talked over the last couple of weeks about us and them and people who are different from us, it, it's kind of easy when we hold them over here. But I don't think that's what we're called to do. I think we are called to draw closer. And the way we do that is by entering into relationships. And once we know people, we know people. And we know their stories. And we know what is making them not have enough time and energy to, to, to mow the grass or do the other stuff that we on the outside use as indicators that, man, they got it all together. What would that look like? It's kind of scary, isn't it? Uh, and I'll, I will confess, it, it is, um, it's a great preaching concept, but it's dang hard to do. Because all that stuff, all those things come flying back up that uh, were part of my bubble world that were part of this construction project that I used for so long. And, and whether, um, I kind of have a feeling some of you guys have bubble worlds. I had a couple of emails this week that said, yeah, I'm real familiar with that bubble, bubble construction. You know, one of the things that um, living inside a bubble does is it affects your vision because the plexiglass around those bubbles kind of distorts the way people really look. Because for the most part, it keeps them at a distance that you don't get to know them for who they are. You can just assign the rest of their story. You can see form, but you can't really see function. And, or you can see kind of uh, the outline of people and give you just enough information to fill in the bits and pieces. This little book that uh, a lot of us have been reading has poked us in a lot of uncomfortable ways. It's called Gracism. I would encourage you to uh, get a copy of it. It's by David Anderson. But he shares in this an African proverb that I want us to all read together and then just kind of pause for a minute and kind of hear it again in our heads. Would you join me, please, in reading this out loud? When I saw him from afar, I thought he was a monster. When he got closer, I thought he was just an animal. When he got closer, I recognized he was a human. When we were face to face, I realized that he was my brother. Gosh, how many of us make decisions about that person from afar in the busyness of our, our world? The other thing that I become conscious of is uh, inside that bubble, I think things should sound a, a certain way. You know, uh, for some, last week's experience with our rapper friend pushed some of us out of our comfort zone. Uh, but yet for others, that was uh, a wonderful expression of their love and their faithfulness. And um, it just made me think deeper about these preconceived notions that I have about how the world's supposed to look and how it's supposed to sound. When Chris and I were talking about it this week, he said, well, I have a great illustration of that. And um, I said, well, would you please share that with us? And um, one of the ways, um, well... One of the things that speaks to a lot of us is music, right? But music has to sound a certain way to be correct. And I don't think it quite, I don't think it sounds like this.
What do y'all think? Is that, y'all want to hear the rest of this? It's irritating, isn't it? When we hear music that doesn't line up with what we think music should be like, when the world is, um, for the most part, out of tune, we assign a decision, a judgment, and we're like, I don't, I don't want to listen to that. I don't want to go to that because it does not express what I think music should be like and what I think the world should be like. That, for me, is how music was from listening inside the bubble. What we know from this amazing song that we sang a moment ago by Gunger is that God intends all of us, I believe, to live outside of these bubbles, to live fully engaged with the people that we come upon on life's pathway, to stop and bandage them, to, uh, as best we can, get past our fears that we assign, um, that there are certain situations that we can't do that. Um, I don't have the answer for that because that terrifies me to say, oh, we're all going to stop and we're going to get really close to that wounded person. Um, join me in, in trying to help figure that one out because I think that's what we're supposed to do. It just seems really, really scary to me. I want you to hear before we sing it these words and then we're going to sing together the chorus as we wrap up this morning. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things out of us. You make me new. You are making me new. You make me new. You're making me new. Join me, friends, in uh, opening our hearts and our minds to be made new to acknowledge where we are, but to have such higher aspirations of where we can be. You make beautiful things out of dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of dust. God, it's really scary, but yes, we do want to be made new. Take our hearts, take our hands, take our minds, oh God. Form us into the body of, that you always intended us to be. Challenge the way we look, challenge the way we listen, challenge the way we look at and decide who is our brother. In your name. Amen.